Headless architectures and Mac architectures are now being rapidly adopted by brands and retailers to build their digital experiences. And this is what's driving composable commerce and the shift towards best of breed suppliers. And what's really exciting is that there are new technologies starting to emerge to support Mac and composable architectures. And one of these technologies is GraphQL. And in this video today, I'm gonna take you through what GraphQL is, how it works, and how it supports Mac and headless architectures. So let's waste no more time and let's get to it. So to understand the issues that GraphQL solves, let's take a look at a hypothetical product details page from an e-commerce platform. And let's assume for now that this product details page is built from microservices. So when the page is first retrieved, it will make calls to the CMS to get the header and the footer. It will call the product service to get the basic product data. It will call the basket API so you know what the status of the basket is. At the same time, it will call the ratings microservice and the reviews microservice. It also may call the recommendations API for similar products. And once these first initial calls are made, other calls will be made to other microservices. For instance, the initial CMS calls will bring back some standard content, but it also may reference items in the catalog microservice. You may need to call the catalog microservice to actually build the entire navigation. Also, when it comes to reviews, you'll be given a list of review IDs and you'll have to make a series of calls to the review API to bring back the full details. The product call itself will bring back the basic details of the product, such as its name and description. It will also bring back a list of variants. And in that list, it will indicate which variant is the default variant. The product call may also bring back the references for the delivery and return options. And you may need to call another API to get the details for the deliveries and the return options. And now you've got the SKU for the default product variant, you can then call the product variant service to retrieve the detailed information about the product, such as its specifications and its attributes. To build a list of variants in the UI, you may also then need to call the product variant service again for each one of the variants in the list so that you can have an image of the variant and its name. It's also at this point you can call the media service to get the list of images and videos that are associated with the PDP. And what this shows is how many microservice calls we actually have to make to build a product details page and how many sequences of microservice calls we need to make to build a product details page and the dependencies between these microservices. And the first problem is the sheer number of microservice calls you need to make. And if it's not architected well, you could hit real performance problems. And the reason for this is something called latency. It doesn't matter how fast a call is processed by a service, it still has to connect over the internet. And that connection takes time. Yes, the time taken can depend on your internet connection, but it doesn't matter if your connection is super fast. All of these calls soon mount up. The old way of building software had the advantage of components being connected using code, which had zero latency. So the first issue we need to address is reducing the number of service calls, and in particular, the first service calls that we have to make. The next consideration is something called underfetching. A microservice, by its nature, means you get a discrete set of data it's responsible for, which means you don't get everything that you need in one single call. Those things it's not responsible for, it will reference using IDs, and these IDs can be passed into further microservices calls to get that data. This means to fill in the blanks, you need to call other microservices. For example, with our product details example, we first called the product service to get the basic product information, like the name and the description. We then took a variant ID, a SKU, and we passed that into the variant service to get the full product details, including the specifications. At this point, you might also call other microservices to get the price or the inventory status. What underfetching really does is it creates a chain of dependencies which means you have to call microservices in sequence, which only further increases the amount of latency and decreases the performance. As well as underfetching, you can also overfetch. And this is related to how much data we are retrieving. When you call a microservice, you always get the complete set of data, even if you only need a subset. For instance, a microservice for product details will give you all the product details, even if you only need the name and its price. In our PDP example, we wanted to display the list of variants in the PDP. 
and we had to call the product variant microservice and retrieve all the details for every single variant, even though we only needed the image and the name. And this is the same for something like the shopping basket. You'll get a list of IDs, you call a product service, but you only want a thumbnail, a name, and the price. Overfetching can also impact performance as well as increase the amount of code you need in the app to reformat the data. If you like this video so far, can you do me one little further? Can you scroll down a little bit, press that like button so that this video can be shared with many others? We can think of microservices as very verbose answers to some very specific questions. So trying to work something out requires you to ask many questions and sift through some very long answers. It could be like having a conversation with data of Star Trek. GraphQL is a new way for systems to talk to each other. It's a way of defining a single answer to many questions and only getting back the data that you need. It is in effect a query language for APIs. To understand GraphQL, you need to understand two key concepts. The first is to create a schema in GraphQL to define the data that you need. This is the answer to the big question. The schema defines the data model for all the concepts in your system. For example, a schema for a product will contain everything. The basic product details, name, description, the ratings, the reviews, all of the variant details and specifications. Everything that you need to know about a product will be in that schema. For each of the areas in your data model where you need to make an API call, you have something in GraphQL called a resolver. And this is the piece of code that goes and retrieves that data. And this code could simply just call your microservice. And the second concept in GraphQL you need to understand is that of the query. And this is where you get to construct specific questions you want to ask. Unlike a microservice where you ask a question and get the same verbose response, GraphQL allows you to ask very specific questions and define what data you actually want back. You can basically specify which parts of the data model you want back in the response. For instance, you could ask for a product and state that you only want its name, its description, its price and its image. Queries also allow you to ask many questions at the same time. For instance, you could ask for all the products in a basket, asking for only the name, the price and the thumbnail. GraphQL is an efficient way that systems and applications can talk to APIs. It increases the performance of application front ends by massively reducing the number of API calls. It increases performance further by dealing with underfetching and removing those dependency change that causes the sequence of API calls. It provides developers with a fantastic interface for building user experiences because they don't have to get bogged down by the API architecture and detailed data models and dependencies. GraphQL can also provide an abstraction layer that insulates your front-end developers from API changes in the back-end. GraphQL can also be easily extended as you build out your back-end systems or you start to strangle out your monolith. GraphQL is a great addition to Mac and headless architectures. And if you want to know more about Mac-based architectures, I recommend watching this next video, What is Mac Architecture? Or even watching this video, What is a Microservice? to get a much deeper understanding of the complexities of Mac architecture and the value of microservices. And if you like this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. But for now, it's time to say thank you, goodbye, and I'll see you next time.